Ready to start your ESG journey? Get going today with Social Suite, and you could start reporting publicly in 30 days. With investor pressure mounting and regulations just around the corner, there's never been a better time to start your ESG reporting. Social Suite takes the complexity out of environmental, social, and governance reporting. Social Suite helps organizations to measure, monitor, and report on their progress with fast, simple, and affordable software. Create value through ESG in order to raise capital, improve brand and reputation, as well as mitigate risk. Social Suite has helped almost 100 micro to small cap companies report on ESG, with some starting their baseline report in under 60 minutes and reporting publicly within 30 days. ESG is a lot easier than you think, and you're probably already doing it. So take your sustainability reporting to the next level with measurable progress. Start your ESG journey today with Social Suite, an ESG software company for micro to small caps. Visit socialsuitehq.com. That's social, S-U-I-T-E-H-Q.com to learn more. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast. My guest on the show today is Anthony Ambrose, president and CEO of Data.io. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is D-A-I-O on NASDAQ. Data.io is a global provider of advanced data and security deployment solutions. These solutions are used by some of the world's largest manufacturers, programming centers, and contract manufacturers to securely program integrated circuits and bring their electronic devices to life. Virtually every electronic product today incorporates one or more programmable semiconductor devices that contain data and operating instructions essential for the proper operation of the product. You hear that description and one thinks, okay, I I can wrap my head around that. But then when you ask the question after, okay, well, what does that all mean? That's when the fun part of being a high tech micro cap comes into play. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Well, not every microcap story is as simple as a consumer goods story or some SaaS platform. That is both what provides opportunity and conversely, barriers to entry if something sounds too complicated. In the case of Data.io, they're somewhere in the middle. But I say all of this because we spend the first part of the interview working through the best way to understand their business for the everyday non-high-tech investor. We also discuss the automotive electronics growth and their place in this market understanding the Centrix platform and their vision for the company for the next three to five years. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Anthony Ambrose, president and CEO of Data.io. Anthony, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm great, Bobby. Thanks very much for having me. Absolutely. It's great to have you on. So I, I wanted to invite you on because I, I saw recently you did a, a, a great fireside chat with a friend and colleague here, uh, uh, Maj Swaydan from geoinvesting.com. I think I saw you did one also with Avi Fisher from Longcast Advisors, who we also uh, just had on the podcast recently. So I was like, all right, I, I want to take a shot here and uh, ask you a few questions and learn a little bit more. So, you know, to start us off, um, h- how would you describe Data.io in that one line? Sure. What what Data.io is the global leader in device programming and security provisioning for products that are being manufactured. We focus on putting the initial load of firmware into electronic devices right when they're being manufactured. Perfect. All right. Great. Uh, There's a lot to dissect there. And uh, (laughs) that's why I I love that question. It always sets me up to go go down a thousand different rabbit holes. But, you know, before we go into all that, you know, I also want to take a look back at Data.io's history. You know, when was the company originally founded and what was that original thesis for its founding? Sure. Uh, Data.io is a unique company in tech in that we're 50 years, now 51 years old. We're founded uh, incorporated actually in 1972 by several pioneers who invented the device programming category. Okay, now for many of your listeners, they, they won't understand what it was like, but back in the day, 
there were not this, this wide plethora of tools available to put data into your semiconductor chips if you're an engineer. And so Data.io basically invented the category and you take a chip, it, it would look like a bug, you know, a dip package with the big thick leads and you pop it into a socket and then you'd have a, a you know, a, a numeric keyboard and you have to load data in and hit enter and, and then literally invented that so people could put data into their chips, okay? And they'd use that for engineering development. They'd also use that for manufacturing. Um, and, and eventually the company evolved. They were actually in what I call Data.io 3.0 right now. So that was Data.io 1.0. Um, and then the, the semiconductor companies in the 90s were the advent of the PC and low cost connectivity through things like PCI and serial buses. They developed their own set of programmers for engineers that became very, very uh, effective and low cost. They weren't universal, but they, you know, you didn't need universal, you needed it for your, you know, whatever job you're doing. And so the company had to pivot away from engineering and uh, manual to production. Production and manual, and then uh, added automated handling capability to the programmer. So that you, you know, if you're running a manufacturing line, you don't necessarily want a whole bunch of people picking up parts with tweezers and popping them in programmers. Um, but literally that's what they did until we came up with robotics handling. And so now we're in the third generation, which is much more sophisticated around factory automation, a whole host of things that complement programming. Uh, think about how you want to integrate your factory control into your programming systems. Think about how you want to add not just programming, but uh, serialization, security, customization. It's much more now a business being a really, really finely tuned piece of manufacturing equipment that goes into the world's most advanced factories to support markets like automotive electronics, uh, high-end industrial. Uh, think of the you know, smart factories, uh, the controllers that actually go in and build the smart factories. And, and so that's really where we're headed today. We're on the third instance of the company. Instead of just programming, we have to know programming, handling, security, communications with, with uh, factory interfaces, and also support hundreds of thousands of different pieces of silicon um, and, you know, adding thousands more every year. So it's, it's a very dynamic business. We manage it on three continents. We have a headquarters in Redmond, Washington, USA. We have a strong presence in Shanghai, China. And, and a strong presence uh, near Munich, Germany. Absolutely. All right. So the, thank, thank you for, for catching me up. So, I mean, another question kind of from just your beginning with the company, because if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you started uh, with the company in 2012, right? That's correct. So how has your experience or the thesis when, from when you originally joined changed? And, you know, now that you're CEO and president, how have you steered some of that change? Sure. We've, we've gone through several uh, major inflections while I've been the CEO. I, I came on board, and my background is in semiconductor technology, both from manufacturing, development, sales and marketing with Intel. I was there for over 23 years. And then also in the telecom business, building systems. And actually, that combination of semiconductor capability and systems knowledge was really, really useful for data IO. When we came on board, uh, the company had its core business and was sort of dabbling in some things that uh, they thought might be interesting, made some acquisitions in the tool space. And I, I came on board and said, you know, I, I just don't see how that's going to work for us. So we just stopped doing that right away and focused on our core business of being a great supplier to the device programming industry. And at the time, about 38% of our business was in wireless, which was, you know, smartphones would be another way of, of saying it. And um, so my initial focus in the company was to get the product development get us focused on having the best products in the industry again. We, we'd lost our way a little bit. And, you know, our, our engineering team and our marketing team did a great job. And inside a year, we introduced our flagship product, the PSV 7000, which is still available today. We've updated it with hundreds of new software and hardware features since the original machine. But the, 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 the fundamental concept of that machine was introduced in the first year I was CEO. And that's been just an outstanding success. We followed up that handling technology with some new programming technology we call Luminex, which is about 20 times faster than the technology replaced. It was really, really disruptive. 
And those two combinations of technology focus combined with a sense that we saw the, the wireless industry consolidating to companies that we weren't really strong with, namely Samsung and Apple. Um, we'd had a number of other companies, RIM, uh, LG, for example, where we had good wireless business, but um, they were getting squeezed out. And so we had a, an internal, you know, uh, I guess you'd call it a come to Jesus uh, session, you know, about, well, if wireless is going away, what are we going to do? And we, we looked at where we were also strong, about 20% of our business at the time was automotive electronics. And we'd had a sort of a slow but steady growth in automotive through a very strong presence we had in Germany since the mid-90s. And we said, you know, automotive is changing. After the recession of 08, 09, a lot of the vertically integrated companies were blown apart and, and electronic supply chains were being reconfigured. And those companies uh, really liked and trusted data IO. And, and we knew there were going to be a lot of new entrants into the field. So we internally reconfigured our thinking to what we called automotive first, okay, from wireless first. You say, well, what are the differences between the wireless industry and the, the automotive industry? Well, what I like to say is, you know, if, you, if your wireless phone blue screens, you just turn it on and turn it back off, turn it off, turn it back on again, and you're okay. Um, if your anti-lock brake system blue screens, you know, you're lucky to walk away. So the quality aspect, the, the, the ability to support customers, the automotive way of thinking is very, very different than a consumer electronics device. And so the good news for data IO was we already had the vast majority of that thinking in place. We had the relationships, we've been doing business, but we really restructured all of our internal processes to be thinking the automotive way. Uh, Okay, how do you, if you identify a problem, there's a failure, how do you, how do you root cause it? How do you explain it to customers? <clears throat> there's an automotive way to do that. Um, how do you establish spare parts and engineering support in five continents? Okay, because we have customers that literally are buying from us and have systems on five continents. We're not in Antarctica, we're not in Australia, but pretty much everywhere else there's a data IO system. And you, you think about how you want to do device support. You never, you never want to release anything that hasn't been fully tested and validated because this is going into a car, okay? And so that means you have to, you have to restructure how you uh, support new requests for silicon development, as an example. We also have resilient supply chains. So in other words, we build and manufacture in two locations. And before COVID, that was theoretical. Hey, you know what happens if there's a little bit of you know, an earthquake in Taiwan or a, a, a hurricane hits Texas or something like that, you know, and you're down. Uh, COVID made it really real, okay? And we've actually <clears throat> proven that resiliency model because we, we took it on the chin in Shanghai when we were locked down for about 60 days uh, almost a year ago. We were able to keep production going. We had some delays, obviously, with materials we couldn't get out of Shanghai, but our Redmond facility picked up the slack and we were able to keep customers um, going. And so this whole automotive first thinking has to permeate everything you do in the company. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people now that, you know, automotive is cool for everybody, right? So people come in and go, yeah, yeah, we do automotive. <clears throat> okay, well, great. Well, do you have all the things I just described? Oh, by the way, do you have $12 million of cash in the bank sitting on your balance sheet? So, for example, you know, you can weather whatever the market or or COVID or, or anything else, God forbid, throws at you, okay? Um, and so this is how we talk to our automotive customers about, you know, there's really, it's data IO that understands your business in a comprehensive way. And um, so those transformations take time, but I'm, I'm really pleased with the way organizations responded. And now 60% of our business uh, from a revenue standpoint goes to the automotive electronics market. It, and it's been that way for about five years. Absolutely. So one, uh, one quick follow-up on um, your, your automotive customer base. I mean, can you, can you name, can you name any names or are they under? Sure. Uh, yeah, okay. But before I start naming names, I'll, okay. I'll throw something out there. That's a piece of red meat for your listeners. And I'll say it here, I don't think you can drive a car that's made in any kind of volume quantity, and I'll call volume more than 50,000 units a year, that doesn't have data IO programming in it. 
Okay. So unless unless you're driving an exotic or a custom, uh, you're driving a car that somewhere in that car has got programming from data I.O. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. It, it, so in, in better understanding how data I.O. products and solutions and working with the automotive market and, and really trying to also keep in mind, you know, the opportunity available for the company. You know, it's not that like all your customers are using the full suite of services that data I.O. Some are maybe using a couple things here and then others might be using the full suite. Can you give us a better understanding that of that? Sure. So when you, when you look at, you know, what matters in our business, right, we've identified, you know, several vectors of performance that matter, obviously programming. By programming, you've got to be able to, to take the customer's file and move it into a piece of silicon in a way that's fast and 100% reliable. Okay, that, that's the core of the business. And then you, around that, you have to have fast handling. You got to move parts in and out of the programming engine quickly. You got to be able to do things like add laser marking or inspection. A lot of customers want to make sure that, you know, the part didn't flip over or things like that when it's going into uh, tape and reel or something like that in their factory. Pretty much everybody uses those capabilities. Those are fundamental. What we're increasingly seeing is more and more people are adding things that we've just made some very interesting announcements on our, our Connects technology that brings together the programming machine with the factory control. So if you've ever been to a, a factory that builds electronic components, you see these big things, long SMT lines. You start with parts and tape and reel on one end, and you get out panels and boards with, with silicon uh, soldered down, tested on the other end. And in between, there are all sorts of things. You got to place the parts. You got to cook the thing so the solder melts and everything gets connected. Then you do inspection. You do testing. All this. Because of the history that I mentioned earlier in the podcast, programming sort of been off to the side. Okay, its own little bastion. Um. But the way the factories are going today, more and more companies are going to be bringing that in. So they want to control the programming. They want to extract data from the programming process. They want to manage the programmer as an integral part of that SMT line. And that's been our vision. Uh, it goes by a lot of names. Smart Factory is probably the colloquial name. Industry 4.0, if you're an industry insider, is probably what you're most used to. But more and more, we're seeing customers that just want to have that ability. They're taking their programming and making it an integral part of whatever they do. And so this is where, again, data is leading the industry with our, our Connects platform. It, it's, I won't bore you with the details, but the technology is such that it's it's got a very scalable architecture. The customer can configure exactly what they need and, and, and go at their pace in terms of using all the information that's made available to them from the machine. So that's probably one area that, you know, to your point, not all customers are using everything, but I think more and more will be using that capability. The second area that is very, very exciting for us, <clears throat> and we're seeing more and more customers asking about it today, is how do I secure the products? Uh, security comes in a lot of different flavors. But when I talk about security, I'm talking about things like establishing a very, very strong root of trust in hardware so that products can be confirmed to be not counterfeit, number one. Number two, that they can be managed downstream. And I'll give you a good example. So let's say uh, you pick uh, a, a, a smart doorbell, okay? When, when you set that up, right, the doorbell manufacturer wants to make sure that, you know, that's, that's Robert Kraft's doorbell there. And so they assign, you know, that indicator to your house and your account and whatever. And so they know that the video stream coming there is, is from your house. Now, if that's not managed properly, you know, someone could hack in there and say, hey, you know what? Now I'm controlling your doorbell and I'll, I'll decide if I want to turn on, you know, the, the, the screen or turn it off. If, I, if I'm, I'm trying to break into your house, I'll disable it. I'll change the configuration. And, you know, none of that is theoretical. We've seen cases where security cameras have been hacked. Now think about that for a second. You buy a camera to put it up. I want to see what's going on outside my house. And it turns into a hacking weapon. Okay. Or baby monitors with my, my other favorite one where people would hack into the baby monitor. Um, you can avoid all that by establishing, again, what we call a strong hardware-based root of trust. Now, how do you do that? 
Well, it turns out a data IO programming machine configured with a neat little black box called an HSM or hardware security module that stores and, and categorizes and maintains private keys in a PKI encryption scheme. That's a fancy way of saying the security that's all over your website, right? When you go to the bank, you see a little lock on your web browser. That's what it is. It's PKI. But that technology can be employed into the programming process to establish this strong hardware-based route of trust that establishes identity and allows devices to be managed and things like that in a very secure way. We've been talking about that for years. Um, frankly, we were early. We thought this is a really great idea. Programming machines are a perfect place for this because you can do it in the right place in the manufacturing flow. It's very cost effective. You don't have to create a whole bunch of new experts in, frankly, low cost regions of manufacturing where most of the stuff is built. Um, and that, all of that's still true, but we were just early. And we, we've been figuring out, okay, we're early. The demand is starting to happen. How do we make the product better? Fundamentally, how do we make it easier? So to back to your question, you know, what are people using? Not everyone's using security today, but more and more people are going to be using security. And I maintain that in a decade, you won't be able to program anything the old insecure way. You're going to have to have a secure strategy. Well, I'm, I'm actually a little surprised to hear that, you know, with with kind of the electrification of cars, uh, I mean, literally every new fleet, it's like there's all new, you know, display, everything like that. I mean, obviously the growth, you know, Tesla's, you know, I'm in, I'm in LA, everybody got a Tesla, yeah. you know, so you would think that there was, I mean, I'm sure Tesla has their own things. So I don't want to comment on that, but like, I, I but I, I'd be, I'm, I'm kind of surprised to hear that a lot of these automakers aren't thinking more about the security with the electrification of their fleets becoming no, more and more advanced. That's a really, really good question. I want to differentiate between what a brand like a Tesla or Ford or GM would do. They have these Please. big black boxes they wheel up at the end of the line and they put their own credentials in. So they'll secure the car. Okay. But now if you're, if you're a supplier of electronic components to those nameplates, like let's say you're a Bosch or a Continental or a Visteon or a Borg Warner or somebody like that. Okay. What are you going to do to protect your own intellectual property, right? You're providing them maybe a, a computer or an instrument cluster or a, a vehicle infotainment subsystem. You have your own IP, right? There. You want to secure that in case something else gets hacked in the car. You, you want to make sure they can't get into that subsystem. So this is a very relevant conversation of what's the responsibility of the tier one those are the people in the, that sell to the nameplates. What are they doing for their security and how do they protect themselves, okay, before it even goes into the car, okay? And, and every one of them has got a strategy they're thinking about now about how best to do that for intellectual property protection, for upgrade protection, for managing those even through the OEM downstream. So your point's a, a great point. The, the cars themselves are, you know, the nameplates have got a strategy to protect the car. And that includes each individual uh, sub-assembly maker protecting their own uh, unit, if you will. Absolutely. Hey, Anthony, I usually save this question for a little bit later, but I have to ask this right now because, I mean, when, you know, in doing my research for Data.io, listening to a couple fireside chats that you've done and, and then even hearing you today, you know, how difficult has it been communicating the Data.io story? Because it's a high tech part, you know, components, business. I mean, how, how difficult has it been? Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not easy. Okay. And people say, you know, can you, can you, can you make it simpler? And, I, I, I do when I when I have a when I'm face to face, I can show a phone with that's that's blank and then I push a button. It's, you know, the blank phone is your phone before date IO. I push a button and the screen turns on and they, you know, that's your phone afterward. Literally, the, the, the firmware is in there. People seem to understand that. But the it, it's a fundamental challenge. And by the way, I'm, I'm open to any ideas you might have here. But the concept is we work with the most complicated systems in the world, right? Automotive electronics. A car is a really complicated system, probably the most complex high volume system that's built, okay? You know, airplanes and nuclear subs are complicated, but you don't build 100 million of those a year. And we work in a way that to be good at what we do, we need to have credibility in 
all the technology vectors I just described, okay? And we're only $25 million, you know, dollars a year of revenue, okay? So it's not like we're a huge multi-billion dollar company that can throw armies of, of smart people at these problems. Um, but that's what makes it fun, okay? This is a very fun job if you're, you know, an engineer and a curious person, okay? Yeah, it absolutely. It can be a pain in the neck if, if you, you know, if, if you don't... If you're not motivated by intriguing things and solving problems, you know, this will grind you up and spit you out pretty fast. Oh, dude, you're you're like the classic microcap story in, in every way, shape, or form that like I I've, I've you know, I, I've I've talked to it with my 12 years of doing this, you know, in that components kind of the do basically everything that you just described. But I will say in the question right before, how you describe using the analogy of um of the doorbell or the the door security system. i thought that was a really smart way of of describing what you guys do i thought that made a lot of sense so if you know if if everybody's listening that's why I, I would i would invite you to go and re-listen to that part because i i think that's that's really important there so you mentioned the company is 20 you know you guys just re were recording this on a thursday march 2nd 2023 you guys just reported uh full year uh results uh on the on february 24th 2023 you know you mentioned that the company in 2022 did about 25 million in revs you know tell us a little bit more about the auto and i think you said in that release about 60 percent of revenues is attributed to automated electronics so tell us a little bit more about the growth of this industry for sure. data io <clears throat> So I said earlier, you know, we've been automotive first for several years, and um, the last three have been obviously very turbulent times, right? COVID, the associated decisions made by the auto companies about trying to forecast demand and, and getting it all wrong, and then canceling their supply chain, and then the supply chain saying, well, good luck getting the parts you need because I'm selling them to the server and the mobile phone industry and the PC industry. Right now, we see that, that basically... Like, the whole supply chain mess and shortages uh, is is coming to an end. Now, it's not, you know, there's always going to be a spot shortage of something somewhere. But in terms of systemic challenges to automotive electronics, we think that's over. And I'm basing that on just some recent conversations through touring some customers through Asia. And, you know, one guy flat out said, oh, silicon shortages, that's so 2022. Okay. And that's a direct quote. Um, from someone who's not usually that humorous. So the w that part of the disruption, I think, is behind us. So what's left from a, a secular trend? Okay. Well, number one, every car that comes out is using more electronics than the model it replaced. Period. Full stop. There are certain things that are accelerating that. But when you net it all out, and, the, and smart people like McKinsey, and, you know, the big semis like NXP, Infineon, uh, Qualcomm, you listen to them and they believe you're in a, a long term secular double digit growth rate for electronics content in cars. Now, what that means is for an industry like ours, that has been growing, you know, mid to low single digits over a decade. We're now entering a space where the semiconductor content is growing 12% a year for a decade, which means essentially the market triples in a 10 year period, if you do the math. That's really exciting for us because that's a tailwind for us in a market that we're very dominant in today, right? I mentioned, you know, you, you can't drive a car that doesn't have data IO programming in it. Um, we have 50 tier one customers worldwide, including pretty much every name that you'd know and a bunch of names you don't know and can't pronounce because they're emerging companies in China and India and other places that want a piece of the action in automotive. And so our job is to continue to be a great supplier to that industry and, and capture that growth because it, if we do our jobs, all we have to do is hold our customers and continue to work with them as they expand factories and make sure new entrants understand the value of doing business with data IO. So the number one thing we have to do is to continue to grow in automotive while that market continue as, continues to add to electronic content from in-vehicle infotainment, from active safety, otherwise known as ADAS, or otherwise known as the path to autonomous driving, okay? The, you know, people think autonomous driving, you take your hands off the wheel and drive. Well, to, to make that happen, you need to add a whole bunch of stuff 
to the car. That's a technical term for very technical lidar, yeah. cameras, radar, <laughs> control. Um, I'll, 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 Jordan, Jordan coached me on this. I, I used a, a term I won't use now, but I'll call it that it's the backseat driver technology. Okay. You're driving too fast. Slow down. You're too close to the car in front of you. You know, you're drifting out of the lane. All this stuff is, is, is in your car today and it all has to be programmed. Okay. Um, and the beautiful thing is we're already in the factory. So if a customer that already has data IO needs to add another programming uh, job, they can, they can do it for, you know, a couple thousand dollars of investment and um, they can, they can add this job to their manufacturing flow. It's really, it, it, it's amazing the cost economics once you have the machine in the factory of just adding more and more work to that machine. Got it. But the, the real exciting thing <clears throat> that sort of turbocharges this whole industry is the move to electrification. Because electric cars, just the way they're architected and structured and the feature set, tend to have two to three times as much silicon content as a standard internal combustion engine car. And so as the world moves to electric or electric hybrids or plug-in hybrids or some combination of electric, that, that turbocharges the demand for uh, programming and uh, really helps data I.O. And, and so I can also put your product suite in perspective as well. So it's the Centrix technology platform that's powering all this, that what you're selling to the automotive uh, electronics or to the automotive industry. And then you're also now sending, selling the Centrix platform on its own for uh, more industrial use as well. So just to well, better understand. Yeah, just to clarify, we, yeah. we saw the data IO uh, platform for data programming pretty much everywhere. Centrix is the brand name for our security provisioning system. Now, the the beautiful thing is, as, as I mentioned earlier, security is becoming more and more a requirement in pretty much everybody's uh, product planning. And so we have about 440 of our PSV, which I call the modern generation of, of programming technologies, and probably got hundreds more of the of older generations out there. But Every single PSV that we have that does data programming today, plain vanilla data programming, can be updated to include Centrix technology, our Connects technology, our latest programming technology, a whole host of other smaller advancements and enhancements that we've made to the platform. So because we've taken this platform approach, right, it gives us a leg up as, as technology evolves, we can go to customers and say, Look, you know, we'll be happy to sell you a new piece of equipment if you need it, but you know, you can just upgrade your your existing stuff for a lot less money. And people say, well, you know, Ambrose, you know, well, you just you just lost the system sale. Well, no, I, I didn't, because you know, an upgrade can be very profitable for us, and it also is part of the the discussion we have early on with customers about why they want to buy data IO, because they know that we're protecting their investment over you know decades when they have this stuff working in their factories so uh, I, no no I, I no finish your thought and then i, I have a it's a changing topics a little bit so okay. what, what were you saying no i was just i was just going to say and, and and for example on on centrics we actually have had cases where a customer has been a great you know data programming customer and they go hey i got this new security part here great let's centricize your system for you and um you know we send a guy out that later that day they have centrics very good. So I think another question I have for you to, I, and I think this will also help with explaining the data IO story even, even further is, can you describe the competitive landscape? Like when you're going to win business, who was your number one or number two folks that you're sure. always competing with? So there, I, there, the way I look at competition is really in a couple of different buckets. Okay. Everybody has to program the part. The firmware has to get into the chip some way. So, the first set of competitors are what I'll call substitutes. If you're not going to buy data IO and our technology approach, which we call pre-programming, which means we, we program the part before it gets placed on the SMT line. Remember that big factory I talked about earlier? We're on the front end of that with our technology. Well, you could also program at the end of the line. You know, I'm, I'm testing the board. I'll just do some programming then. And that, that makes sense for certain types of applications where, you know, small code and stuff like that. But 
um, it's, it's a little less flexible. So the first thing is, what are we doing to attract more programming demand to our technology approach? Okay. Now we have, you know, we reported we have 21 new customers. And last year we had 20 new customers the prior year. A number of them are coming from end of line programming because they said, look, it, you know, the number of changes we're getting are, are, are accelerating and end of line is just not flexible enough for us. Okay. So data.io, what can you do for us? And so we actually want a very a big electronics, automotive electronics company. You'd know their name. They're Japanese based. And um, that was a big deal for us. So the first set of competitors are the substitutes. All right. Another substitute would be uh, companies that offer programming as a service. Now, this is sort of a, a co-opetition model because we sell equipment to those companies. And for small customers, it's great to have a service that does the programming because, you know, it's a big investment to go, you know, it's $100,000 or more to go put a piece of equipment in uh, to your own factory. And if you're doing a thousand parts a year, just the, the math doesn't work out. So you go have somebody else do your programming for you and, and you pay them on a per part basis. But increasingly, as we've been able to get more efficient and customers are paying more for shipping back and forth and they're paying more for inventory and they don't want to have delays and they want to keep an eye on everything in their plant because uh, chips are scarce we're finding more and more people want to bring the technology in-house so substitute number one is the end of line we're more flexible more more convenient we're pulling demand from that substitute number two would be outsourcing and the economics are making using data io more and more compelling so that's the first round of competition because I want to grow our total available market by pulling more and more demand in from substitutes. Okay, so now we get them into the data IO technology realm of pre-programming. And you can go by data IO or brand number one or brand number two or brand number three. It's a very competitive market. We have a lot of companies out there, um, all private, all run by, in many cases, a founder, very smart individual with a vision, They've been very successful, um, but they run it, it, you know, for their benefit. They don't need to get very big. Uh, they want to make, you know, they want to get paid their cash dividend every year. Um, and they may not be as willing to forward invest in some of the technology futures like I've described, like Centrix or Connex or, you know, being, being there when the customer demand shows up, they're much more reactive. Um, they provide good quality products, okay? So we have to be on our toes at all times. But I don't think they have structured their business to have the scale and support that I mentioned to support automotive customers. So the way the market segments is, you know, we, we go after that higher end of the market. We go after high end industrial because that's very similar to automotive. And, and we can explore and, and go after other deals where it makes sense for us. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of our competitors will be doing much lower value programming to you know, uh, consumer products or other things like that, where they're just they don't need all the the capabilities I've described, and frankly, they buy on price. Um, if someone buys just on price, they're probably not a data IO customer. Got it. Um, but what we want to do is make sure that 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 whole competitive landscape that our customers understand where we're focused and the value we're delivering, and you know, we've been able to command a premium in the market in places where premiums are tough to come by. Okay. And, uh, you know, we, we had a recent deal in the fourth quarter where we had a new automotive electronics customer in China and it was data IO on one side and a local supplier on the other. Mm -hmm. Now we have great local service and support in China. We got some of our smartest people there. In fact, we have more people in China than some of the Chinese companies have, but we were able to get a premium to this automotive electronics supplier because they trusted us. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody's you know programming a light bulb or programming a washing machine, we may not be able to get that premium, and we may decide you know do we want that business or not. Um, it's opportunistic, right? We won't go chase it, but if our factory is in full or something like that, we we can go throw a few machines at a problem and fill a factory, and then maybe we'll go take it. You know, Anthony, you, you brought up something that I thought was, that I really wanted to talk to you about because, 
you know, and, and looking at the, you know, the recent announcement on your quarterly on your uh, year end financials and, and everything, you know, it seems that you have to have a real balancing act with on from a capital allocation perspective with R and D and then pedal to the metal sales, right. Where you, 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 you really have to focus on making sure that you're staying as far ahead of the curve as you possibly can in order to outcompete some of the folks that are trying to win the same business. Right. How, how do you think about that from your perspective on balance on the right balance? I think you, you captured it. Uh, We've staked out a position that says we will be the R&D leader. We will provide new capabilities to the market, and uh, we get paid for that. Um, There are other people that say, hey, I'm cheaper than data IO. And uh, in markets that don't value what we're bringing to the table or innovating and only value price, right, you know, you're going to have to let that go. But most of our customers value what we're, we're bringing to the table because they understand. Now, Sometimes if you're in a room with a junior purchasing person, they only understand, you know, what, what's the price and how much discount can I get from you today? I had a conversation, you know, not too long ago where I had to remind somebody, you know, you evaluated a competitor, okay, at a lower price. And then by the time you, you came to buy, they'd already, they told you that the platform they gave you had to be completely upgraded you know, essentially hauled out and a new one brought in to, to service the needs you had for new technology. I said, you know, we're not doing that. You, you, when you buy a data IO system, new technology can be upgraded seamlessly with the handler and the platform that's in place. And that's a big deal. That's a hidden cost for someone that we call it a forklift upgrade, right? If you have to deal with that. So it's up to us to not only have that R&D innovation, but have a sophisticated sales presence that can explain that to customers. Because a lot of people understand cheap price, okay? But um, quality and capability and long-term resilience has to be sold. So we not only have to be really good at R&D, we have to have an outstanding sales organization and our reps and distributors that we partner with globally have to be educated on a continuous basis. Absolutely. All right. So, Anthony, I wanted to ask another question to you that it's it's in the same vein of one that I asked earlier about, you know, how difficult it is with communicating the data IO story with with investors. But, you know, uh, we, we met we met through Jordan, Jordan Dow from Dow IR, uh, you know, thank you, Jordan. And, you know, so, you, you know, he's taking you to some conferences. You've kind of done the, you know, the dog and pony show talking, uh, doing one on ones, all that stuff. You know, what, what would you say are some of the most frequently asked questions that you do get from investors? And maybe we can address them here. Sure. So, you know, we've talked a lot about the products and technology. So let's go to the first one. Why do I want to own your stock? Okay. Sound like you're a great company, but why do I want to own your stock? How am I going to make money? Um, and it's really the fundamental question that, you know, anyone on this podcast should be asking. It's a real simple answer. What, well, all the things I just described, we have enormous operating leverage. Okay. So we get, if you look historically at our numbers and you can do the math, if you add about a million dollars of revenue, you're going to get $400,000 or 40% of operating profit improvement. Okay. So as we grow, as we see these secular long-term trends in automotive and security take hold, as we add more high margin services around our security provisioning, the operating leverage for earnings growth is enormous. Okay. And that kind of operating leverage can generate a disproportionate pop in uh, income, which given where our stock is traded at, you've seen, you know, you can have a big move in data IO stock. We, we are not for the faint of heart. You know, I wouldn't put you in a widows and orphans fund. Okay. You know, get your municipal bonds for that. But if you want a growth story as part of your portfolio that has, you know, micro cap leverage and the operating leverage that a company like data IO has, it could be a very, very interesting story for you. So that, that's the number one question. Why do I want, you know, I, I understand all the technology. That's great. But Ambrose, why do I want to own your stock? Because we're small and we can get big and getting big means the earnings go up a lot, a lot faster than a lot of other companies. For sure. Well, then I, another, I, I would say probably the first question probably they all ask as a follow up to that is like, okay, well, what is my downside risk then for from that potentially happening? So the downside risk is we're small. And uh, there's been business cycles, right? You know, and, and we've seen a lot of downside risks. Pretty much all of them have happened in the last three years, right? What if your factory gets shut down for 60 days? Well, 
the good news is, right, got $12 million in the bank. Uh, you know, book value is close to a couple bucks a share. Um, so there, there's a floor there that you don't have a lot of micro caps. Most micro caps are living hand to mouth, waiting to dilute their investors when they need to raise capital again. And it's a brutal market out there, you know, if you're trying to raise capital. We got money in the bank. The only way we'd need to raise capital is we had some sort of really interesting opportunity to acquire somebody that would probably be accretive and really build on the story. So, you know, again, if you like micro caps that have money in the bank and no debt, you know, the only debt on our balance sheet is the, the lease obligations we have for our offices, right? We don't have any classical definition of debt. Um, that makes us a very unique micro cap story. I mean, you don't need to raise money tomorrow. You're not going to be out there with a tin cup, you know, getting diluted on a pipe or some other transaction. Well, no, we don't, we don't need it to operate the company. Sure. So that, that's another thing that you can go, aha, maybe this is a different micro cap story. Sure. So the downside risk is protected because we have the cash in the bank and we, and, and, you know, we, you, you've seen what the world can throw at us. Okay. Right. You know, knock on wood, I, it can't get worse than having, you know, the government locking you down for 60 days. Can it? I was going to say, I, I would invite everybody to go check out their most recent quarterly uh, or their, their announcement on February 24th. Cause you actually go into detail on all everything that you've kind of experienced, especially in the last yeah. two years from supply chain and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, yeah. Listen, my my, it, it, it's difficult to say the least, right? And having to deal well, with that. But, but again, you know, the, the beautiful thing is we got a, We got a very resilient team. Yeah. Okay. Um. And and some people have really stepped up. Um. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't been to China in four years. Right. And I, I, I've been to Germany. You know, but I haven't. Had, I haven't been able to visit my team in China. And and the fact that they've been able to manage through what they've had to deal with. And, and still provide just an outstanding organizational performance. It's fantastic. You know, the, the CEOs get to go on, on podcasts and talk about how great their company is, but uh, the ones that last have a really, really strong organization that you don't see or hear much about. Um, and that's really, I think, a very, very strong characteristic of Data.io. Absolutely. Hey, one, one quick question on, you know, having, having a team <laughs> based, based in China and not ha being able to go and visit. I mean, is there any, is there any risk that, or, or, I'm sure you get that question all the time asking about like, okay, having oh. operations, you know, um, IP, you know, all, all, all that good stuff. I, I think it's very clear that the world's view on, on how, how to engage with China is different than it was five years ago. Okay. We're, we're doing commercial products. Um, we're doing things like automotive electronics and industrial. Um, but, you know, it's something we have to, we have to pay attention to and right. Investors are, are wise to ask, you know, well, what if questions about what if certain things happen? Um, Again, we go back to the resilient supply chain. We, we already know what it's like if our China team is shut down for 60 days. We had to go through that hell. Okay. So we're, it, it's not pleasant, but we're resilient. Um, conversely, if the world is going to a China plus one manufacturing strategy, right, where they say, hey, we're in China because supply chains are good, talent is good, costs are low, but we're going to be somewhere else. Well, guess what? Data has been doing China plus one for 15 years. Welcome to the party, pal. Right. So we know what's going on there. Um, people want to come to Mexico. A lot of my Chinese competitors are saying, oh, my gosh, there's business in Mexico. Yeah. Si, senor. <laughs> muy, muy grande. Uh, right. Sure. And, and um, but, you know, again, as the market leader, we have to be in front of the rest of the competition. Because. They're going to say, hey, we can do, we can try and do everything data does at a lower price. It's like, yeah, but you really can't do everything we can do. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, uh, China plus one is a huge opportunity for us. We understand it. And again, managing these these highly dispersed supply chains um, is not something everybody can do. Absolutely. All right. Well, Anthony, you've answered all my questions. I got one final one for you here before you, uh, before I let you go, you know, from, in your opinion, you know, and from what you can tell us, of course, where do you want to see the company in three to five years? And what would you say are some of the inflection points that'll get you there? Sure. I, I think, so let's, let's build in and call it three phases. Okay. Number one is automotive first, you know, the, the phrase stop, start, continue, that's continue. Okay. 
Just keep going, turn the crank, continue to be the outstanding supplier, continue to support that market as it continues to grow and, and grow and build with that. Number two would be accelerate the security deployment around our Centrix platform. We've doubled revenue for Centrix every year for the past couple of years, but it's, it's still a small number. Th that needs to become more meaningful and material to the company because it helps us in a whole bunch of ways. And then the third item is, given the strength of our balance sheet and our ambition, you know, what else can we do to tuck in something that might be interesting technology or capability or maybe small private companies to accelerate our growth uh, and leverage that solid foundation that we already have? So it, it's really the three things are around keep doing what we're doing today very well, accelerate what we need to do in Centrix, and then look for opportunities for inorganic growth that's accretive, high probability of success, and something we can afford. Very good. All right, Anthony, we're there, man. Where can our audience go and find more information to follow along the Data.io? Uh, www.data.io.com uh, or follow us on uh, LinkedIn. Or uh, and, and there's a lot there. Or you can send an email to Jordan Darrow at, uh, at our investor relations page on our website. Very good. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for joining me today. Really do appreciate you taking the time. Good luck. Stay safe. And I look forward to our next update. Very well. Thanks very much. Thank you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast.